everyone. We're going to call the meeting to order um, soon, but I'm going to try to wait to make sure we have a quorum of planning commissioners. We have three so far out of the four needed. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. I had a question. This sure. is being recorded, I gathered. Will it be available for people to watch somewhere, at ORCA or what city website? Later on. Yeah, it is it's being broadcast on Orca as well. So they'll have and it. on the city website, right, Mike? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. the Zoom the Zoom recording is just a backup in case something goes wrong with the Orca, but I've never had an issue with the Orca media um being able to record it and get it onto their website. Thank you. Okay, so we've got plenty of planning commissioners here now. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is the September 11th meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission in 2023. Um, we first have to approve the agenda because this is a, it's a regular planning commission meeting. So we've got to go through the typical uh, steps. So if I can get a motion from a planning commissioner to approve the agenda. So moved. Okay, motion from John and a second. Second. From Gabe. Okay, those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Agenda is approved. Um, the next thing on the agenda is comments from the chair. Uh, you know, today is about comments from everyone else um, that's not on the plan commission. So, um, gonna just skip that for now. Um, later on, I'll be doing an introduction to the listening session, but for now, I don't have anything else to, to add, um, except maybe to the planning commissioners that, you know, summer's over, so we'll be resuming our normal meetings. We've, we've missed a few recently, but they'll be coming at a normal rate in the near future, just so everyone knows in case they're wondering. Okay. Uh, the next thing on the agenda would be general business, which would, um, that's normally a time in which we would take any questions or comments or concerns about anything that's not on the agenda. But considering the vast majority of this meeting is about hearing comments about density, I am going to assume that there's also people who want to participate and give ideas about other things. Um, but I think putting that before the density conversation doesn't make as much sense. So if everyone's all right, I'm going to essentially bump that down one on our agenda. Um, and to put it another way, uh, I just plan to, once we're done with the dens density discussion and people at, are, are through giving us feedback, um, then I would want to just open it up to other zoning issues that people have and do it that way, if that's all right with everybody. Okay, so so that's going to be our plan. So with that, uh, we are at the reason for the evening, which is the Montpelier Planning Commission's holding this listening session for uh, the development of some potential zoning amendments. Um, Mike is going to give some background. Um, before I pass it off to you, Mike, I, I did plan to just kind of introduce some of the some of the topic here, which is, uh, you know, welcome. I'm Kirby Keaton. I'm the chair of the Planning Commission in Montpelier. Um, this discussion that we're going to have is mostly about the concept of density and zoning. So one thing I wanted to make sure that we um, cover before jumping um, into it is to make sure that we're all on the same page about what density is. Um, so just in case anybody's not incredibly familiar if they're fuzzy about it, um, in the zoning context, density is the number of the units that are allowed per square foot on a parcel. So um, that's, that's the, you know, as, as it's used in the Montpelier zoning, that's what density means. So what it doesn't mean, just just for clarification, is um, it doesn't have anything to do with the size of a building. It doesn't have anything to do with the shape or the design or anything like that. 
Um, we have a whole bunch of other zoning that does address that stuff um, and other things um, like design review too, which we're going to be talking about tonight. But so that's what density is. It's about the number of units that are allowed on a parcel for, for the square footage of the parcel. The reason why we're having this discussion, or a big part of the reason anyway, is that uh, an organization called Congress for New Urbanism, which is a planning think tank, um, a national um, well-regarded think tank, uh, kind of on its own, uh, working with AARP of Vermont, reached out to uh, the city. Uh, it's been a year and a half now, actually. And uh, one of the major suggestions that they had was that Montpelier should get rid of its zoning density caps because uh, they thought that was one of the quickest ways to, to bring down barriers to housing. Um, so what we've done tonight to kind of set the stage is the Planning Commission's put forward some of its own ideas about, about how we could go about addressing this. Um, it was, it's not just the Congress for New Urbanism, by the way. I just want to make that footnote. It's also about housing for us because that's a big priority. Um, our understanding is that uh, a majority of the residents in Montpelier recognize that, that a lack of housing is a major problem in Vermont, potentially the biggest problem in Vermont. And um, he's probably up there with child care as something that's just always a, a major problem in the last decade or so. Um, and so it's a major problem. And, you know, that's that's part of it, too. And housing, you know, is on our minds all the time with Planning Commission. Um, what we put forward was a few ideas. I'm going to throw them out there real quickly because I don't want to take up a ton of time. But um, some of the things we put out there for people to respond to are the potential for us to not have density caps, a density cap being, you know, a limit on how much density, how many units are allowed on a parcel um, in the uh, design review district, which is a district in our zoning that is regulated uh, based on the appearances of things. Because um, Congressman New Ur Urbanism noted design the design review district and design review rules uh, in its letter, and it's also, we know, a concern of the community um, that any changes we make that are that are to encourage housing, we want to balance with the aesthetics of our community. We want our community to have the same character that we want to just allow space for more people. Um, so that's one thing, no density caps in design review district, the logic being design review district already covers aesthetic issues um, very well. Uh, another thing we've thrown out there is just allowing four units everywhere. Um, and that would just mean that uh, if you, you know, if you're trying to have uh, an, um, an in-law apartment situation, or if you're trying to have like create, make your house do a duplex, that, um, which that's allowed everywhere. But if you're trying to add units and you've already got small number of units. But that's just going to be something that Montpelier allows. Um, we've also, you know, considered something like maybe instead of moving away from density entirely, like CNU had suggested, we could double the density and we could do things like um, instead of basing it on design review, we could just base it off of eliminating density uh, just around the downtown area and kind of do it um, in a, in a different, like something that's off design review, but but similar. So those are the things we've, we've kind of put out. We're really looking forward to what hearing what other people have to say. Um, like I said before, we're going to take uh, suggestions and things. I'll, I'll try to make sure there's time at the end for zoning issues and topics that are not density related. And um, this is a listening session. It's not a hearing. We haven't decided anything. This is it's not something that's required by law. Uh, we we really just want to hear from people before going forward with our stuff. So that's it for me. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mike, and um, from there we can get going. All right. Well, I have a presentation that I put together, but you kind of went through most of the pieces. So I don't know where everybody's background is on a little bit of the history. So maybe I'll just very quickly go through. Yeah. 
And so for people who are just trying to get caught up, haven't been familiar with the whole process, the city went through a very major zoning rewrite in um, that was adopted in January of 2018. And that made changes, a lot of changes, changed our zoning significantly in the city, making most neighborhoods 90% compliant. And by that, we mean um, prior to that, most of our housing units were non-conforming, which meant they we had zoning regulations, but nobody's houses actually met it. They were all grandfathered in because they were built before the zoning. And that doesn't make any sense. Uh, if we love our neighborhoods, let's make the rules that allow great neighborhoods to be built. So we changed our zoning to make sure that 90% of our neighborhoods were correct. So um, your setbacks would match what your what we actually see on the street and your densities and your uses all matched what was on the streets. Uh, we also made changes that allowed duplexes on all conforming lots. We added some environmental rules that didn't exist before, including riparian wetlands and slopes. We loosened the rules on parking, which used to be very strict, um, not necessarily in how many parking spaces were required, but in how you count them and how you're allowed to put them in. And we streamlined the permitting. So permitting is much faster, much more efficient now. Uh, and then we amended them about once per year to fix a number of small things, some small, some big, but we would each year come back with another amendment. And the last one was done in 2022. We haven't made an amendment yet in 2023. This one was supposed to be in March and then April and May and June, and now it's been pushed. So we're still trying to get this one in for this year. And as Kirby mentioned, we did, after those were reviewed, we did have AARP and the Congress for No Urbanism take a, take a look at them. Uh, I won't go over this too much because Kirby kind of went through it, but um, they recommended moving away from density. Uh, they noted that design is more important than density. And if the city has strong design regulations, then they didn't feel we really needed to be regulating density as much as we are. And I wanted to point out that the city has revised and updated new design review regulations in 2020 and adopted new design guidelines in 2022 that help people applying for and people administering those new design review rules. And this is a picture. Um, don't know if you can see my cursor, but you know here we've got Main Street. Um, no, here we've got Main Street kind of coming down through the red, the red blob. Here's State Street. This is the area with the Capitol complex. This larger pink area is National Life. It's up in here. So if you're trying to get yourself oriented a little bit. And East Street, this is um, the college is in the design review. Barry Street is coming down in the this lower arm. And then Main Street, the roundabout, and a little ways past the school. So it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what's in our current design review district. Um, you'll sometimes hear the historic district. The historic district is different. It's a, it's, it covers different properties. Um, so some areas we see like 9-3 and 9-4 would be in the historic district, but not in the design district. And then there are areas like uh, national life that are not in the historic district, but are in design review. So they're really two separate areas. Um, so design review is what we regulate, and there's a set of rules for that, some of which are administrative and some of which need to go to the design review committee. Um, and Kirby also went through this really quickly. What is density? It's a dwelling units per acre. Um, so a dwelling unit can have any number of bedrooms and bathrooms. So a seven bedroom, three bathroom house is considered one dwelling unit. It's not counting the number of people that live there. So when you think density, sometimes people think people, it's the number of dwelling units and one dwelling unit can have seven bedrooms, but that same house could be divided into a three bedroom apartment, a two bedroom apartment and a one bedroom apartment, same house, maybe the same number of people living in it, but it's now counted as three dwelling units. So a lot of times that's why Congress for New Urbanism and others are trying to get away from using the um, density of dwelling units because density of dwelling units doesn't necessarily um, really match what is on the ground when we're talking about the number of people or the impact on the neighborhood. Um, so 
some of the final density background stuff, there's no density in the urban center right now. So urban center one, two, and three, which is your downtown core, parts of Barry Street, um, all those areas, they, there is no residential density. You can have as many units as you can fit into the, into the buildings. Um, another thing to keep in mind with density is that the bigger homes, many of these bigger homes that were built um, a century ago, um, were built for bigger families. So in the 1950s, the average household size had more than four people in it. Today, there's less than two people per dwelling unit. So, you know, we've got uh, the same size house, um, but half the number of people living in it. And currently, more than 40% of all households are people living alone. So a lot of times, we're really looking at trying to get more dwelling units, not because we're looking to get more people, but because we've just got big houses with one person living in it. And so that becomes um, an issue um, for taking care of things. Um, these were the four things that Kirby went over for the planning commissioner thoughts that we would have you think about removing density from that district we were talking about. Maybe we don't regulate density in the design review district because Congress for New Urbanism says, as long as you're doing a good job with your density, you're doing okay. And, or with your design review, and we have good design review rules, and here's the area they apply. We could remove density from additional zoning districts. We could remove density for projects of four units or, or less. We already do that now. If you've got a single, if you've got a conforming lot, you can have a duplex. We could change the zoning to say, if you've got a conforming lot, you could have four units. Um, it's just another idea that's on the table. We want to put some ideas on there. And then another one is, as Kirby mentioned, doubling the density in all districts. And that would still have some density limits, but would simply expand the amount of potential development that could happen. And these are just a couple other changes that are being considered that are housing and density related that are, because we are looking at doing a zoning amendment, um, we are looking at rezoning Country Club Road we are looking at um, the requirements for, for what is now called Act 47, was called S-100. These were uh, the Home Act that was changed by the legislature. Um, and it has a requirement that all districts with water and sewer allow five units per acre. The bill actually has a lot of requirements. We already meet all of them, except for this one. And that's because we have one zoning district of Res 24,000 that wouldn't meet this requirement. So Town Hill Road would have to be rezoned Res 9000 in order to come into compliance with that statute That statute change. And there's some argument Res 9000 may need to have density of one unit change to have one unit for 8,712. That's five units an acre. The reality is I don't think so because um, we already allow two units. So everyone with a conforming lot can have two units. So I think we already meet it and we could leave it at res 9,000. But I did want to just mention, these are the only things Home Act related because somebody may have a question on that. Um, and then we had some other changes that we're looking at, like splitting multifamily into two groups and a few other smaller things. But that's not really the focus of this conversation today. Um, this one, we really wanted to just have you guys talk about you know, what we haven't talked about that you think we should consider what you like or don't like about the density suggestions. Is there an idea you like better than another, or do you not like any of them? Um, and what questions do you have? We're, we're here and we can answer your questions. So that's, that was my quick discussion just to try to make sure everybody who may not be completely familiar with our zoning has a quick leveling of the playing field and we can try to take it from there. And so I guess with that, I can open the floor and start hearing questions or comments. Yeah, so I can I can take it back from you, Mike, to um, call on people. And then, uh, like I said, let's let's talk about density first, and then we'll talk about other zoning ideas after. Um, I guess to facilitate this, we can use the raise hand function on Zoom, which is under reactions at the bottom. And yeah, so there we go. We've got some of those, and um, we can we can call on folks. Um, we don't have a ton of people, so um, 
not I'm not going to set any limits at the moment. Um, I'm just gonna gonna see see where we go without rules for a minute. Like if we zoned without rules, maybe that'd be crazy, huh? Uh, right, anyway. I'm going to be helping somebody get on, so I'll let you guys okay. handle it, and I'll be working on some stuff in the background. We got somebody who's trying to get in. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, Barb, um, you're first on my screen, so go for it. Um, sure. Um, Mike, be, uh, I know Mike's leaving, but does the Homes Act require that us that we allow any any house to be four units? That was the way I was reading it. Yeah. I, I had the same question. Did we get you, Mike? It looks like he's unavailable. It looks yeah, like he's on it the does phone. look like he's so, unavailable. All right, so let's we'll, ask We'll him save that. that one. Save it for later. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there are certainly some benefits to, I mean, that's why we did the duplexing in the first place. There's certainly benefits to increasing that to four units per building. I, one of my concerns is what would we do about parking? Um, you know, we still have the one parking space per unit currently, um, and that's going to increase the amount of uh, parking required. Um, also, and this is maybe just, this is just my particular uh, bone to pick, but it seems like every time when we add an ADU, there's an additional pretty substantial fee for a sewer hookup, even if we are not hooking up sewers. So does that mean that four units um, adds that cost to a homeowner uh, for each of those additional units? Um, and I think finally, my concern about the four units per building is does that trip any kind of sprinkler requirements from the city? So, um, I'll just leave it at that in terms of, of that particular piece of um, the zoning suggestions about four units per built for acre, or sorry, four units per building. Okay, thanks, Barb. Um, Joe, I had uh, the do next on my screen. You're muted. Yeah. Just, sorry, you sorry about that. I was trying to lower my hand. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, so a couple of quick questions. In reviewing what Mike just presented, um, obviously there are some areas of the uh, districts that are proposed for higher density that were impacted by the flooding. And I'm just concerned, okay, what are we thinking about moving forward if we're going to try and rebuild downtown? I mean, should we wait until there's some sort of consensus as far as what we do, as far as rebuilding some of these areas that are in the flood zone? Obviously, national life's not impacted up towards the college is not impacted, but I'm just concerned that we increase density and um, we're going to be in a flood zone. And we saw what happened downtown in July of this year. And we don't know whether we're going to have a similar situation next year or 10 years down the road. The second part of my question is, uh, I believe we did a major rejigger of the zoning in 2018. I wanted to find out what the impacts of increasing the density has been so far. Have we seen a dramatic increase? As far as I know, we haven't seen a dramatic increase as a result of the density. So I'm wondering if this change is going to have zero effect as well. And then the last question I had is, I believe that it was Minnesota eliminated um, density limits in 2019, right after we changed our zoning. And I believe that initially they haven't seen much in terms of results. I was wondering if there's any studies that you are aware of to figure out what's the long-term impact on something this, this big of a change. Is it? I just wanna find out if you have any data. Um, yeah, it looks like Mike's occupied. I can try to handle um, what I can about what you asked. Um, as far as the flooding, it's something that we've talked about. Um, in general, just outside of this uh, conversation, because it, it's bigger than that, you know, the idea of new construction in flood areas is, you know, something that's put on our mind. And um, so far, uh, we've talked about how 
with new construction, it has to it has to be built to with flood mitigation in mind, and we have a lot of you know we have a lot of rules about that. Um, the and then Mike can speak to spe uh, specific like examples better than me, but my understanding is that uh, you know a lot of the buildings that have that, that were hit hard with the flood were like grandfathered. You know they're not. They're not as high up as they should be. They, you know, they have basements when when we actually wouldn't allow that now, um, and on and on. Um, so, we if 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 any new construction happens, just period, due to any kind of zoning stuff we do or some other reason, uh, you know, we're expecting that if it's happening there, that we actually do have good rules and regulations in place for new construction. We just haven't had a lot of new construction, so the stuff we have is not caught up. And that, that's my understanding of, like, of, of that situation. Um, uh, has there been a major increase since 2018 changes? I'm not sure exactly which ones you're referring to, but because downtown's been zoned without density caps for longer than 2018. But um, uh, I don't know of any significant uh, moves forward from that. And, and I don't think that this, we don't see this change as any silver bullet type thing whatsoever. We see this as an incremental, you know, there's a lot of barriers to housing and this is one, but it's by itself, we're not expecting it to be huge. That where we do think or hope that it will have impact is with people converting large houses into multi-unit, um, either rentals or or condos or, you know, turning turning the the big houses we have into more units is is i think the biggest hope we have there and the minnesota thing um i don't know but that's interesting i'm, I'm interested in looking up um, mike's mike's back on mike's mike's back so uh uh joe had asked the question mike about um if you know anything about any studies that are done or just anything about um, minnesota's experience with changing density um or getting rid of density caps I I haven't heard anything specifically from Minnesota on that. No, um, I've I I've I remember the past year or two that there's been a lot of people patting themselves on the back for doing a lot of the stuff that we'd been doing already. But a few of them had had removed density caps. But I haven't I haven't seen any report of what the impacts of that have been. I assume it's probably Minneapolis or or that area. I think it was the Twin Cities. I believe that they eliminated there. It may even be a state law at this point. I remember reading an article. I'd have to see if I can dig it up, Mike. I may have saved it somewhere. Um, I could see if I can get it to you. I I can Google it. I'm sure it'll pop up on on enough of my list serves that I'm on. Okay. Uh, Steve, uh, I have you next. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, my interest and concern really and request to you is that you defer any substantive discussion of actual changes um, in zoning and density, what have you, while the city wrestles with the aftermath of the flood. We certainly have a housing crisis in the city, but I think our overwhelming reality at the moment is the aftermath of the flood and where we're going to go from here. Um, the city, as you know, has undertaken a, a citywide kind of all hands on deck approach to um, reviewing what happened and looking at uh, ways to go forward. Among other things, expertise will be sought from hydrologists, from engineers, from structural engineers, housing people, public safety officials. We honestly don't know um, what direction the city is going to want to take at this point. And I think that it makes sense to defer any substantive discussion of zoning until we know what that might be. Um, for instance, um, will um, concerns about residential development in, in flood prone areas look to uh, increase um, housing opportunities in other zones where it may not be so, um, where there may not be so many opportunities now. Uh, Mike mentioned the country club changes. Will the city want to do more at the country club that is not is, that is not uh, consistent with the present ideas on zoning changes. I honestly don't know, and I don't think any of us know at this point. So I'm basically um, 
suggesting that you um, delay or defer any any thoughts on actual changes until we have a, a clear idea of where the city as a whole wants to go. And as a, as a sub note, I'd say I hope that you all intend to participate in that process and uh, deal with um, one or more of the uh, um, topics that have been identified for, uh, for further review. So thank you and um, good luck. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Michael Reed, I have you next. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, had uh, one question, and um, uh, the if they're now allowing um, by law the uh, four uh, units per dwelling, um, the uh, fourplexes, um, doesn't that mean that even in the twenty four k? Uh, roughly half an acre, um, you end up with more than five units per acre. So yeah, one of the changes to the in the Home Act was a requirement that in zoning districts that have water and sewer, which is all of our zoning districts, except for the rural district. The rural district, by definition, is the area that doesn't. So if you're in a zoning district that's not rural, then you've got sewer and water. And by, by law in 2024, when it goes into effect, it has to be a permitted use for single family, two family, three family, and four family. That doesn't mean the four family is exempt from the density requirement. So if if you were in a, we'll just round things off. If you were in a quarter acre zoning district, then you'd have to have one acre in order to have your fourplex. So that's it, but you can't make it a conditional use. It has to be a permitted use. Um, so even though you might have a, say a, a, a third of an acre yeah. lot, um, it wouldn't necessarily allow you to have four units because you still don't have enough density. And that gets to the other part that we're talking about, the density requirement. Should we have this density requirement? Um, does that kind of answer your question? I think so, yes. Um, okay. Um, and, um, and Jen, just a, a couple of uh, comments. Uh, the um, It seems to me what you are advocating or thinking about um, is uh, moving from basically um, individual owners to um, renters. Uh, if you're talking about uh, dividing up uh, large houses into multifamily units, um, then you're going from uh, going in from a, a single owner to a landlord tenant arrangement. Is that um, basically what? what you're thinking about? Uh, it doesn't technically have to. So one of the differences is um, you could, uh, we don't regulate the ownership type. So you'll, you'll, you will find an, a number of these in the city um, on, on Loomis and, and Liberty, you'll find some, they'll make condominiums. So you'll actually divide it up and buy and sell pieces of it. So you might own, um, a third of the house, all three of you are in a condominium and you own three pieces of the house. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be landlord. You could still end up owning a portion of it as a part of a condominium. Um, so that's, but yes, it would, there is that obvious, obviously there would be a number of things like um, making more landlords, but it's not necessarily the only outcome that could occur. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I would just yeah. I would throw in there on, on just the policy issue of um, we we know that we need um, we need renters and homeowners in Montpelier both both the housing market and the rental market are both you know um, statistically in terrible shape um, so I guess we're not thinking about that specifically we're hoping that it helps both. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, and I would uh, make the observation that from other cities and so on that that is likely to change the character um, for better or for worse. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, I'd like to follow up on one other um, person's uh, comment is that um, uh, I would like to uh, have a good feeling that um, these uh, the changes in density that are being uh, uh, discussed will really help the housing. Um, and um, we've seen a, a number of uh, uh, developments in the, the Montpelier area that seem to be moving very slowly. One which uh, sounded really uh, uh, promising up at Isabel Circle, which was going to be cluster housing and so on. But my understanding, it's now just back to single family. So there seem to be a lot of uh, barriers uh, to uh, to housing. And um, I would hate to see the city uh, changed uh, dramatically in, in its character um, without really uh, addressing, and I, I should say uh, individual neighborhoods changed uh, in their character without adding a lot of housing um, and still having this the, the problem of the other barriers being there. Um, certainly the what I've heard, the little I've heard from developers, is that Montpelier is a, a really difficult place to do development, and um, it's uh, it's not just the uh, the density uh, requirements that uh, are keeping them from uh, from building. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Phil, you're on uh, next on my screen. Thanks. Uh, I just first wanted to clarify, I'm not sure I quite understand the requirements of the new, this new Act 47. I went and looked at it. I'm just going to read a, one sentence to you. In any district that is served by municipal sewer and water infrastructure that allows residential development, multi-unit dwellings with four or fewer units shall be a permitted use unless that district specifically requires multi-unit structures to have more than four dwelling units. So I, I guess... Before I offer my comments, I just wondered if Mike could explain one more time to me um, how how this works and why that density rules would override that requirement in this law. All right, so um, you kind of ignore that last that last phrase, which was added in later by them, which basically the legislature was trying to address a very specific case. Um, in St. Albans, where they don't allow single family duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes because they only allow multifamily. So that's what that last sentence is getting to. But the first part about um, makes it a permitted use. Uh, there's a lot of things even today that you have that are permitted use, but they are contingent upon you having the correct density. So if you in today's zoning wanted to go and build a quadplex, we would make sure that you had enough density to allow the quadplex to happen. If you do have the density, then it's a permitted use. And uh, we had, I think the same question that you're rolling around and pondering in your head, which was um, what did the legislature mean in this? Did, did they mean that quadplexes for units are allowed anywhere single family homes are allowed, or is it, um, as we said, with, with the density. So we did contact our attorneys and we got an, uh, an opinion from our city attorney that said it was what I explained, how I explained it to you, which is that the density still applies. It is a permitted use. So um, if you were in residential 6,000, you would need to have 24,000 square foot lot in order to put in a four unit building, but that would be a permitted use and could not be a conditional use under the new state law. And for our city already, every one unit, two unit, three unit, or four unit use is already a permitted use, which is why I said it that that provision won't change anything in our zoning because we already have all of our smaller single families uh, single family, two family, three family, four family are already permitted uses, but you need to meet the density requirement okay, in that's order to build them. Helpful. Thank you. Uh, I think I get it now. Um, I just wanted to echo 
you know, some of the comments earlier that uh, in the wake of the flood, we really do need to think about uh, where we're going and 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 see what uh, makes sense. Uh, for instance, a lot of the areas that uh, either have no density or, or proposed to have no density in the design review were flooded. Building new structures in those areas means the water that would have been in that part of the floodplain now has to go somewhere else. So it, it in essence, uh, it displaces the water when you when you build in these floodplains. And, and I think that's what a big thing we're wrestling with is how do we allow the the river to flow? And uh, so, you know, I, I I think there's some question as to whether that makes sense. Um, the other thing, if we if we build a lot in the areas that were flooded and a flood comes, even if they're above the flood level, those people may need to be evacuated uh, and we'd have to have plans for that. Uh, their, all their cars would have to be moved out uh, if, if they're in the floodplain. So I, I, I just, again, uh, think maybe we ought to think a little bit more about um, where we want the development and whether we want it in the floodplain. Um, you know, beyond that, um, I, I do, you did say, Kirby, that this would be an incremental change. Uh, I, I don't think I've seen a lot in the neighborhoods that's come about with the density we've seen already. I think it's really, the answer to the more housing is, I'm afraid, big projects, which there's several being talked about. There's the Bow Brothers Apartments, Isabel Circle, Habitat for Humanity, Down Street, Country Club. Um, Building is so expensive. I saw a figure recently that building a house or apartment units five hundred thousand dollars or approaching that, and so I think building larger projects at scale may be the only way we're really going to get more housing. Um, I'm also beginning to think that Berlin and their plans for Berlin Town Center may be part of the answer for our area, and uh, so it may be that downtown Montpelier isn't the right place for some of these projects. Um, you know, it's a very frustrating situation with housing now. The interest rates have gone up. The construction costs are high. We don't have enough workers. You know, the Great Recession, a lot of people got out of construction. So it's, it's, it is a challenging thing. I read recently that the Chamber of Commerce is pushing the Vermont Futures Project, in which they're proposing that we increase the state population by 25% in the next 12 years. Um, I, I just don't see how that's gonna work with these challenges for housing. Um, I'll just finish with two quick ideas. I've been promoting this for a long time. There are a lot of homeowners who, uh, L, who are getting on an age and might wanna to downsize to a smaller house. Uh, so if there are condos or units available for uh, those folks that would open up their homes to, to younger families. Uh, if you're selling a house, you do have some money to put toward a new unit. So. Uh, some finding some way to encourage that kind of construction in Montpelier would make sense. And I don't know how you accomplish the last thing, but we have an extreme shortage of workers and, and whether you could get employers to get together and, and build some housing that would be for their own workers, uh, something along those lines um, may be needed. I, I just see shortages everywhere. Um, and I, you know, they're building a more new memory unit down at Gary Home. It'll be interesting to see if they can find people to staff it. So that that's a big problem, and I don't have a real solution, but just wanted to mention that. But uh, thank you for your work on these. I think these are big topics, and you know the public needs to chew on this stuff a while. So I again urge you not to rush, and maybe have another hearing with a little better publicity about what's happening. Uh, unfortunately, that bridge issue where you had the ad was just after the flood and that never got mailed to everybody in Montpelier. So I think there are a lot of people who haven't become aware of, of the kind of things being discussed here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Phil. Um, Joe, you're next on my screen, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to give um, Nathan a turn first uh, and then I'll circle back, um, assuming you still have something. Mm -hmm. uh, Got Nathan? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for holding this and I'm sorry that I had to join late. I, I was on another meeting, so I don't I don't want to assume that uh, things that I have to add are not already been covered. And Mike, I missed your 
I, I gather you had an initial presentation, and so I'm sorry to have missed that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Phil's comments about building actual brand new housing, uh, as far as I can tell, are accurate. The math is is almost insurmountable in terms of if you want to build rental units and and make the math work. Uh, at least from my perspective as a sort of small time landlord. Um, but we have a way just give a couple of examples of ways that we can make incremental difference. Uh, my wife and I just bought a duplex uh, on Brown street and it's a, it's a, it's a very large square foot building. Uh, it's on a very small parcel and with the current density rules, uh, the only way we could add, you know, transform parts of that building to, a third or a fourth unit is by using the uh, the plan unit development um, and having to, to check the boxes in terms of getting density bonus. Um, and those are not those are not necessarily easy hoops to get through, uh, and they some of them add cost. Um, if the density uh, if the density levels were changed or opened up, um, you know, with a lot less investment, I could make that building into a four unit building add add two units of housing to Montpelier, which would be, I don't know, something like 20% or 100% of which housing has been added in the last year. I'm probably, that's hyperbole. But, you know, when we look at how much housing are we actually adding? And and the answer is very, very little. Um, to me, that seems like an easy an easy way to get to yes. Um, we, have, we have two other properties that have uh, sort of, you know, garages or outbuildings that I could see becoming housing on a similar footprint to what they have. I uh, haven't done the density test in those cases, but um, you know, I would, I would love to get to yes on that. I would love to be able to do that. Um, and we're, you know, I, I, we're at a stage in our lives financially where, you know, we can take maybe some risks and, and wait a little bit longer for something to pay off. 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. And as soon as the kids are in college, that may not be the case for a little while. So I just think, you know, not all of us are Malone or Rubellini or, or whomever who have, I'm making an assumption, but who have access to capital that I just don't have. And and maybe their timeline is different. Um, but I think that I, I can't imagine that I'm alone in terms of um, folks who, who have control over some property and have, you know, care to attend to the housing issue and and want to make, you know, I would love to make uh, something that's accessible, flat living. I'd love to make, you know, there, there's just, there's some great goals we could, we could work towards. And I think, so my, you know, uh, change the density uh, limits would be my first ask. Um, and then I have, it's been a little while since I've read through the zoning, but the you know, height. I think if if someone were to build something new, if you can go to five stories instead of three, or and, and again, I may be operating on bad information that there may not be height restrictions as I think there are. Uh, at least we're not facing, at least in some districts, um, the need for there to be parking spots if for a new unit. Um, if there, if that's still true in outlying, you know, res whatever. I don't know what the other settings are, but. Uh, I would love to see that go away. Um, I realize that it's not, it's it's fraught, right? Just people are going to find a place to park their cars if they have them. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather deal with that problem than deal with the fact that housing is going to become unaffordable for many people in Montpelier because I have I control you know part of the very very limited stock of rental housing, and one effect of that is that I can essentially start charging almost anything I want if I chose to do so because people are so desperate to live here. And that's, that's a kind of injustice that I, I think we would rather not support. Um, you know, and then I, this is not a zoning question, but you know, if, if someone's building a, um, an ADU or something like that, is there a way that the city can collaborate and um, either handle all the cost of, or, or, or some of the cost of the sewer line, you know, the sewer water from the unit to the, to the street? Because again, you know, you know, I, I haven't priced that out, but if it's twenty, thirty thousand dollars, that's a huge delta on a on a sort of small project, and it'd be great to see that. Um, I would I would love to see a sort of a, uh, a saying, um, how can we help 
um, contribution from the city. And that's not to say that's not what I've received. I haven't explored that, but I would, you know, anyway, so that's another thought. And then the overarching one for me, I think is that, and again, probably not a zoning question, but if we had a city funded um, revolving housing loan fund, then I'm talking 10 or $20 million uh, where if Phil Dodd wants to build a six unit and he's got control of a piece of property to do it, and he says it doesn't pencil out at, you know, three hundred thousand dollars for a thousand square foot two bedroom, uh, and but if the city's willing to underwrite, you know, thirty percent of it, it'll pencil out for me. The city gets to keep that equity; they get to extract that equity at some time in the future, put it back into the revolving loan fund. That I feel like if we as a community are committed to growing housing and density within our boundaries, um, you know, I I pay a lot of taxes in this town. Sign me up; I'll pay more taxes to to support that fund because that's a way forward. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Nathan. And um, that was some of that stuff was really, really on point. Like I didn't realize that there'd be someone here with the perfect example like that of what we're trying to get done. So <laughs> it makes it makes us feel like connected to real life as opposed to just policy, you know, um, decision making without that connection. So that 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 was fantastic for me. Um, okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to. Uh, Emma Zabez next. Hi there. Let me see if I can turn on my video. Okay, I can. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my name is Emma Zabez. I live in Montpelier. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Housing Committee. Um, and I'm here sort of with my uh, Montpelier resident hat on and sort of Montpelier Housing Committee, um, we hadn't seen any of these options before, um, so we don't have a comment prepared, but I guess I just wanted to say, echo, somebody said that they would love to see another hearing on this. I would love to see more of a community-wide discussion about what types of housing we do want to see and where, um, and I guess maybe having examples of, so there were sort of four options laid out, but having examples of what does that look like if we go with option one versus option three, like what could that look like um, if it was played out, if it really did change things um, so that people could sort of make an informed um, suggestion as to what they would like to see. Because just looking at those right now, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and yet I think about housing a lot. so. Um, so I'm sure there are other folks in that boat as well. Um, and I also wanted to say that the housing committee, we are always working on a million projects as are you guys, I'm sure. Um, but we would love to, to find a way and find time and energy to work more collaboratively with you all to whether it's having some of those discussions or looking more intensively at the zoning regs, um, to identify barriers to building more housing, um. I think maybe yeah. Kirby, you said like, we don't think uh, this is a silver bullet. We're not sure what this will do. Um, you know, we've talked about wanting to sort of try to identify some more of the, um, more of the features of our current zoning that that could be changed to to really start seeing some, some, some real change on the ground in terms of building. And um, I appreciated um, the previous commenters suggestions and would love to to see more of that. <laughs> Um, yeah, for, so lots, lots to respond to there. Um, the, I think, I think that, that, uh, members from the housing committee should definitely, um, we, we should follow up. We should talk more about this. You, yeah. you know, you're always welcome to come to our meetings. Obviously, um, the biggest way I see us communicating with you is through the recommendations that you've made for us to work on the city plan. Um, and you know, what we work off of there, um, you may miss in the beginning that this is just a listening session. It's not the hearing. So yes, there okay. will be actual hearings. We haven't put anything official forward yet. That's why this is not an official okay. thing. Um, so, so yeah, I think that would be great to, to, um, to touch base more between the two groups. Okay, great. Yeah. Do you have any examples of how the four different options would play out or is that something you might bring to a hearing once you have a recommendation? The, the, yeah, I mean to clarify when when I was talking about how we don't know how this is going to play out because we don't know how what the market's going to do or like you know, yeah. um, and and since it's you know, there's so many obstacles as I'm sure you know and so many people 
in this meeting know that removing just one, um, that's why it was great to hear Nathan's example because he actually did have an example of a project where the density was the thing getting in the way of moving it forward. Um, I think in a lot of things, how they've come out is is maybe density would be one thing. We maybe have other zoning issues too that are in the way. Um, so that's how we don't know like how any change is going to go. We know from experience that when we tinker with things, we redid the zoning and we opened a lot of things up five or six years ago. And the housing market hasn't drastically changed from that, even though our zoning drastically changed and our, and our zoning did, you know. So that's why if I say that it's incremental or I'm not sure what the impact is going to be, it's just, uh, you know, and you just heard Nathan talk about how unbelievably expensive it is to build here. Yeah. We have so much to do. We have so many yeah. changes to make if we actually want to see um, some noticeable growth. So that yeah. when I say that I'm not sure that it's going to do much, that's why because we just have all. But but I but I'm pretty certain that if we don't do anything, if we you know say no to every idea that comes up, that that we're going to stay yeah. exactly where we are. I'm yeah. certain about that. So anyway, um, uh, but how how these specific things? I'm sorry, I didn't really answer your question directly enough. But, uh, <laughs> The, you know, if we, if we take away the density caps from the design review district, in my opinion, that expands what's available, uh, an available amount of space a little bit, but since our downtown is part of that design review district, and it's already has those density caps, and since the areas right around that are already have very high density, um, I'm not saying that is a major, a big major change, that one. Uh, the one where we, uh, the idea that we make uh, four units available everywhere, that complements the design review approach. Um, and I think that one will probably make potentially a bigger change just because it, um, but it's not focused in the way that we sometimes want to focus uh, because we want to try to make the housing walkable to downtown. We want to have that kind of community. Mm -hmm. But but that's, you know, um, and then, you uh, Doubling the density everywhere was one of the ideas. The downside for that for me is that we're still talking about density all the time. And it'd be nice to not do that so we can focus on other ideas and other things. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I don't, but, but no, we, I don't think anyone knows. I don't think. <laughs> And, yeah. and hopefully, <laughs> no and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully city council, when it, things like this come to city council, I hope they realize that no one knows like um exactly like, like we have an idea like i don't think yeah. like i don't think any harm is gonna come like so i'm certain about that but um as far as the impact on housing yeah um i probably talked too much though about that <laughs> thank you uh, so much <laughs> so, yeah i'm gonna i guess uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah i guess i could i could i'll add just two two things real quick one um one is the the reason for some of the incremental density suggestions that were in there. Um, you know, we went through and recommended in 2018 that anyone who has a conforming lot can have a duplex. And the reason for that was because anyone who, you know, it's already state law, anyone who has a house can have an ADU and the ADU is uh, an accessory dwelling unit. Your accessory dwelling unit is capped at 30%. And everyone was like, well, why don't we make it 50%? Well, 50% of your house is a duplex. And they said, we'll just allow duplexes. So that's how we made that suggestion. It pretty much, let's say, we'll just ignore the density and allow you to have a duplex. And, you know, the the world didn't come to an end. And a lot of people have a lot of concerns about removing the density requirement because what could happen? Um, you know, this could happen or that could happen, or somebody can tear down their house and put in a 16 unit building. Um, and we, we've gone through these public hearings before, and we've heard those arguments before. So a lot of times when we talk about this more gradual approach, the gradual approach of let's double the density. Um, and the idea is let's double the density and show everybody the world's not coming to an end. Everybody's not tearing down their houses to put in giant things, or let's allow four units on a conforming lot. And really the idea is, is not that we want everybody to run out and, and convert their house to a four unit. Um, everybody still, there's no requirement to do it. It's just gives somebody an opportunity if they've got the right building to make that happen. Um, and some of this, so when we talk about having kind of a gradual approach, you know, um, I think as, as professionals as in the planning commission, the, the thought is, 
we don't really think it's going to have a big difference. If we got rid of the density requirement, there's a lot of things that are still problems for developers. Um, but we don't think that the catastrophic um, things that we sometimes hear at hearings will happen. So that's why we've talked about let's gradually, you know, let's double the density or let's make these. And the reason why is just because we want everyone to feel comfortable that as we slowly remove density as being a requirement that people will see the world's not going to come to an end. And, you know, if there are, as they, they say, there are things that could be problems, we should be able to see them as we gradually re release the density requirement. So I think that's what, that's what we're looking at. Um, and that's somewhat, somewhat of that. And the second comment I wanted to make um, really goes a little bit to, to Emma's role and to Nathan's comments um, about things like, can we have a housing revolving loan fund and we, can we have these other pieces? And the housing committee is does have a subcommittee that is working on those revolving loan funds. Now we don't have $20 million, uh, we're <laughs> far from it, but we do have a housing trust fund and we do have a housing revolving loan fund. And so we are trying to come up with what is the best way that we could use these money, these monies to leverage more housing, how can we make this happen? And so there are people on the housing committee who are working on that exact question. And so uh, if you've got good ideas, I'm sure the housing committee would love to hear different ideas of how we could use some of our housing trust fund money uh, and how we can use some of our housing revolving loan fund money to support um, accessory dwelling units or other projects. So I just wanted to add that in, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, Jessica uh, is up next on my screen, and then I'm going to circle back to you, Joe. You've been waiting very patiently. Hi. I am also a member of the Housing Committee, and I just wanted to make some comments um, about how important it is for us to do whatever we can do to increase housing in the city and to speed that process up because there's so many people that need housing. Um, and just maybe I misunderstood the tone of somebody else's comments before in regards to if it was gonna increase rentals and if that was good or bad or not. But I just wanna say that there's a lot of us that are renters in town that rent from homeowners that are living not in state. And us renters are a huge part of the, com the community we work here, we raise our kids here, they're part of the school district. And the more family that we can get, whether they're renters or homeowners, is really important for the greater community. Thank you, Jessica. Um, okay, Joe. Yeah, thanks for uh, circling back to me. Um, I had a couple of comments. As we're rethinking some of the zoning, um, I know that obviously post pandemic, the office market has still failed to come back. And I don't see there's gonna be a return to office work or at least, you know, even I work for the state and our office is at Barry City Place. Even on the days where they mandate that we go in, the office is probably about 30% or 40% full. I mean, I'm just wondering if we start looking at part of the zoning regulations that making it easier to convert office space to residential use. The other thing too is, um, you know, just my background as a real estate appraiser, I know that the cost of construction is north of $400 a square foot in Vermont. It's just material cost, labor cost, everything. That's just for a standard. This is nothing fancy, it's 400 a square foot. So you have to factor that into any sort of density, any sort of new building that we're trying to create. One of the other things I wanted to ask too is, uh, do we know if, if there's gonna be anything regarding Airbnbs as part of the new zoning? Cause I think that Airbnbs are taking up some of the rental, what could have been rental housing for long-term renters and landlords have just decided, no, I'd rather do a short-term rental and make more money that way. So I'm wondering if we're gonna address it somehow in this new zoning. And then there was one, uh, go on, Mike. 
Oh, I was just going to quickly answer on the Airbnb. It wouldn't be in the zoning if there is a proposal, and I think the housing committee has been discussing the issue. If there is a proposal, it wouldn't be in the zoning um, just because of the way zoning is structured under Chapter 117 and the grandfathering and the nonconforming and the blah, 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 legal mumbo jumbo. It would probably be either an ordinance or a license um, would be how you would address Airbnb if it were to be addressed. Um, but it wouldn't be through the zoning. Okay. And then I did have one last uh, point to make is uh, while I was waiting is I actually did that research on Minneapolis. So Minneapolis did change their zoning in 2018 to allow maximum density everywhere. And out of a city of 425,000, unfortunately, they only had 53 units built uh, as of 2021. So it had zero, virtually no impact on the density. Just FYI, that was my last point. Uh, Barb, you're next. Oh, thanks, Kirby. Um, yeah, I appreciated what Nathan had to say because 20 years ago when we made rental units, we had a two unit building and we had to turn it into a three unit building in order to make it affordable. And now it's pro quite possible that we need to start creating four unit buildings in order to make the numbers work and the rents not to increase astronomically. So, I mean, that the whole idea of creating the opportunity throughout the city for four unit buildings seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, and actually as a result of the flood, I am now, I now have three families in my house. Um, not because, not because it was necessarily planned, but my Airbnb became flood, uh, flood family. So um, I think for me, the biggest concern about the universal talk about creating um, no density limits within the um, design review district is just to me, that's an elephant in the room is where are the protections to keep buildings from being demolished? Because if you're look, if you have no density limits and you're looking at a piece of property and it has an older house on it, it's gonna be much more lucrative to tear down that house and create a larger building. So where do we have those controls within the design review district? And that larger building could meet every single one of our other requirements. So it's not, the other requirements are not really enough. And I, the, I checked the zoning today to see if there were any stronger requirements about demolition. And I just really don't see them. So I guess that, to me, that's a big question. Uh, thanks, Barb. And if if anyone who's here who has um, developer experience wants to take a stab at Barb's question, then I would be interested in what they had to say. Um, but uh, uh, so, Nathan, um, you're next on my screen. Thanks again. Um, let's see. I think so. When I talk with Greg Gossens, who has way more experience with the sort of thing than I do, uh, Gossens Bachman is, or GBA, is involved in a project in Burlington right now, which is, it's north of 30 units. I don't know how many more, but we talked about the, you know, what um, Joe just talked about, $400 a foot built. And Greg said, in Vermont, the only, you know, the tipping point on that being economically viable for a developer is about 30 units and above. And, and that below that, it just doesn't make sense. And even if, even if he's wrong by half, even if that number is 15, I would argue that if we removed all density requirements, the control factor that, that may answer Barbara's question is just money, right? P people aren't going to build a 20 unit building just out of love, right? They're going to do it. It's, a, it's math. And so if the math doesn't work, they're not going to build it. And, you know, you can, you can look at the last, as far as I can tell, the last dense-ish thing that was built was on Cedar Street, built by Merrill, uh, a six unit where, you know, and he sold it to a year and a half, two years ago for 1.2 million. Um, it's six, it's six two bedrooms. Um, I think that's the last dense thing that was built in Montpelier. And I, you know, I don't know how the math worked for him. Um, but my guess is, um, my guess is he didn't make a killing having built it, owned it for a number of years, and then sold it, even at sort of peak COVID sales price. So I think there are some natural controls uh, 
And my, what I was going to say is, wouldn't it be great to find out where that line is, right? Wouldn't it be great if we just removed all the, con all the limits on density and somebody built some 30 unit monstrosity and we're like, holy shit, we don't want any more of that. So let's go backwards a little bit, right? Like where are we, if we just, if we do this incremental, like, oh, let's ease them a little bit more and see what happens. And I'm not, I'm absolutely not trying to uh, make fun of anybody on this call, but I just think um, the incrementalism in response to, to fears about changing the character of downtown or changing the character of our community, you know, uh, sort of want to see how far we have to go to, to find out we were wrong. And I think we got a long way to go. Um, let's see. And then the other thing was about, and, and I, I'm a little bit out of my depth here, but I think that there's some restrictions on change of use. And the, another concrete example was that I spent a lot of time looking at and, and modeling the 8-20 Langdon Street building. That's the Onion River Outdoors Contemporary Dance of Fitness. It was owned by Andrew Brewer, uh, purchased by Gabe and Lucky, I think. Um, and Gabe, I think, maybe is on this committee. It's supposed to be. Anyway, um, you know, I don't know. I would love to hear what Gabe has to say about that. But when I looked at that and I thought, okay, what if a bunch of this building were converted to housing? Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, the change of use stuff uh, may trigger ADA stuff. It may trigger, you know, and some of that is quite possibly out of our control. I don't, I don't know the details there, but I think, you know, that's a, that's a large building. And if, if that could have been converted, a bunch of that could have been converted into housing, that might've been a plus six, plus seven, plus eight units, um, you know, and then after from purchase to a year and a half later, and that would be pretty awesome. So I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know what sort of yes factors would have to be put into play to make something like that possible, but I don't know who just said it. Uh, I think it was Joe you know, is is sort of class A, B, office space, second floor, third floor stuff. Is that just not as much a thing anymore? And if case, and if that's the case, what does it take to convert it to housing? Thank you all. Uh, thanks, uh, Nathan. Um, Peter, you're next. Uh, yeah, I'm Peter Kalman. Uh, I live on uh, Mountain View Street in uh, Montpelier. Um, I'm going to tell two sad stories of my attempts to build uh, uh, or actually to convert um, for rental to create more rental apartments. Um, uh, 1214 uh, Baldwin Street is a state-owned building, which was advertised um, as being ideal for a um, conversion in, into uh, um, rental apartments. Turns out not to be not not only that it's not ideal, it's impossible. Um, I uh, looked at the building with a contractor. We saw that we could, uh, you know, with putting some money into it, of course, uh, put in seven apartments. Two of them would have been able to be completely ADA um, uh, compatible because they already were. The, because it was as a state office building, uh, it, it was made uh, so that certain parts of the building were uh, ADA wide, wide doors, et cetera. Um, uh, and I was informed immediately uh, by the uh, Department of uh, Planning and Community Development that no, I couldn't put in seven. I could only put in five because if you do the density calculations, that's 5.3 and you can't put in three tenths of a uh, apartment. So it could only be five apartments. So already the math becomes less favorable for me because uh, with seven apartments, I could keep the rents low, um, et cetera. And I said, oh, and and I said, because I know something about the uh, requirements, I said to the uh, the department, I said, well, and what about parking? You know, there's no there's there's, there's no room for parking on that in that uh, on that property because it was a state owned property and the people uh, from the state used the state parking lots. Um, could we get a waiver for uh, uh, for not not to have to provide any parking? Well, no, you can't really. You could apply for a waiver. Uh, you could apply to reduce to reduce the number of parking spaces. I said, well, could you guys talk to the state about this? Could you see whether the state who wants to sell this building and says it's ideal for residential, do they know that you guys have this requirement? Oh, you can do that, they tell me. Well, who do I speak to? 
Well, we, we reached out to the real estate agent who handled it, said, no, you can't have that. So here's a situation where I'm ready to invest over a million dollars in buying and converting a building to create seven apartments, um, uh, uh, beautiful apartments in downtown. And part of the reason is that it turns out that this, this building is not only in the city whatever district it's also part of the state complex we'd have to get state approval and i the, the reason i have this money is because i am doing what it's called a 1031 exchange because i'm selling the building that we used to live in in brooklyn and i only have six months and in six months i could never wade through all the crap that was out there uh to prevent it so i've gone elsewhere i've gone to williamstown where they have no zoning zero zero zoning and I found a five unit, well, it's a four unit building that I could put a fifth unit into and at the same price with actually the same upfront price, but I wouldn't have to put really put much of money into it at all in terms of improvement because the building is already built. I've also found buildings in Barry and I've talked to the Barry Planning and Zoning Commission and they have been very, very helpful because they want me to come in and buy up an old Victorian and put in three and divide it up. And, and you know, the fire chief came in and he walked through the building with me. Someone from the zoning office came in and walked through the building. With me. They pointed out all the things that I would have to do and then got back to me the next day and said, you know what? The, the rules say you have to do that, but we could figure out some ways to be more flexible. And what I would say is, it's not just a matter of lifting zoning, uh, lifting density requirements, it's not just a matter of you know, changing, the, changing the, the regs, it's a matter of giving the Department of, of, of Planning and Community Development the flexibility to do things so that, so that they can say, ah, this is a worthwhile activity. We're going to do everything we can to make sure it happens. And, and there, some of the, the regulations are just written way too narrowly. And it puts the department in a very difficult position. Meredith doesn't, didn't like having to tell me that I could only I put only 5.3 uh, apartments in there, but she had to tell me that. So I would urge that you guys think about ways to put, put much more flexibility into it. The other sad story is I wanted to donate two 9,000 square foot lots to Habitat for Humanity to put, in, to put in two duplexes on each of them under the new two duplex rule um, as, as part of our property uh, here on, on Mountain View. It's just sitting there. It's it, it's just a field. It's it's got, you know, no value to me, and it would be great value to Habitat for Humanity. But guess what? In order to do that, in order to give away two nine thousand square feet lots, the requirements of the Department of Public Works and the Fire Department would have required me to spend upwards of half a million dollars in infrastructure because we would have had to put in a fire hydrant at the end of our street, the, the, the water to go to that fire hydrant, the sewer line, which doesn't go be, doesn't even uh, ser serve our house, uh, uh, what do you call it? Wastewater, um, sorry, um, stormwater contr uh, controls, paving the road. And for the fire department, we would have had to put in a huge, um, cul-de-sac so the fire trucks could turn around. Guess what? We already have a place where casella trucks turn around, fire trucks turn around, snow plows turn around, but no, we have to put in a, 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 a cul-de-sac, which would take away land, making it even more difficult for us to do the subdivision that we were going to do to enable this. Again, where is the flexibility? Where is the where is the where is saying, hey, we are in a housing crisis. You are. I'm willing to give away some land. Habitat had the plans to build it, and it's virtually impossible for us to do it. Thanks.
Thanks, Peter. That was really great. Um, that's a lot of lot of things for us to uh, to tackle because a lot of obstacles. Um, uh, Phil, did you have something else? Uh, just a couple things. Uh, having heard what Peter said, I guess I having my eyes open. There may be a lot of other things uh, that that need to happen beyond density changes. Um, what he's saying that alone wouldn't wouldn't do it. Um, I, I will say this, m earlier Mike was talking about incremental changes and there may be some value in that. Um, for one thing, you've got to get this past the city council. And if you were just to propose lifting all density caps that might get a lot of pushback uh, potentially. Um, people may not want a 15 or 30 unit uh, property next door and that would, those kind of fears might arise. So I think his strategy may have some merit um, and you know there haven't been radical changes with the density changes so far um, and may, maybe you can move in that direction. Um, the last thing just echoing what Joe said uh, about offices, I I think the office market is dead and and I'm wondering if if more landlords will be shifting over to residential downtown uh, in, in the upper stories, or, or the state office buildings for that matter. Um, and that's a little outside of the zoning uh, area perhaps, but that looks like a promising area to me for getting housing soon. I mean, people are working from home. They're not, they're not coming to the office like they used to. So there's, there's a lot of s square footage, I think that could be turned into residences. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um... Okay, so we'll do the last call for if anyone has anything to talk about related to density. Um, and then, uh, so I'll stop. Any more so density? I, yeah, so I did want to add in really quick, Kirby, to answer a little bit, um, to clarify some of the comments Nathan had on uh, the change of use. So I think the the reference he is making to is uh, what would be a change of use in the building code and not a change of use as we have in zoning. So most of the uses in, in that area are all um, permitted uses. But as you make a change of use from a, from a commercial to a residential, that change of use in building code requires a number of changes. That's something we don't have any control over in, in the planning commission or the planning department. We enforce the state building code through the division of fire safety as a as a as a contract, so we're basically enforcing the state building code locally using um, Michelle Savory, who's our building inspector. So, just so everybody's aware, that's that's just a clarification. Uh, or uh, so there isn't a confusion that when sometimes we talk about zoning and talk about change of use, we do have a change of use in zoning, but the change of use Nathan was referring to is actually from the building code, and that that is. That is a thing. Um, as you just shift from one to the other, some buildings that are already set up with sprinklers can very easily shift from office to residential and residential back to office. If it's always been commercial and has never been residential, then you're in a different class and you need different, I don't know, sheetrock and different, there are different requirements because you're going to have sleeping residents. And so the fire codes are higher. So just so there's clarification for everyone. Thank you, Mike. That was part of what I ran into as well. The building codes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks uh, for the clarification, Mike. Uh, it looks like we, we have um, a, a new uh, person interested in commenting on density, uh, Sal. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just thinking about um, what Nathan said about being able to charge, uh, you know, whatever he wanted, um, if he was inclined to do that, and what Jessica was saying about um, renters being important to the city, it seems like a change in density would, it, one immediate effect would be to increase in rental properties, uh, which may bring the cost down um, slowly, but it may bring it down. I just wonder what tools, if any, does the city have to control ownership? Um. When you say control ownership, you mean like well, uh, to, yeah, to like landlords. Like, 
well, rent stabilization or, or requiring a, a building of a certain, certain number of units to be uh, condominiums where, you know, the residents own the property, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. I, I don't know what tools are available. I'm just curious um, what, what, if any, tools the city has and, you know, whether they're worth considering. I'm sure they come with problems of their own. Do you want to answer the question, Mike? Uh, yeah. So the so the question on um, what other tools we have for ownership. So our zoning is actually very open um, and doesn't restrict ownership types. Uh, so we really don't get into you know, uh, timeshares and condos or owner occupied or renter occupied. We really, in the zoning, keep things out. We're really looking at the buildings and seeing um, whether they have the minimum requirements for each piece. Uh, in fact, we have congregate living as a separate. We talk about dwelling units, but we also have congregate units, which are just slightly different. They don't have, all, they share some of the, the required elements. So we don't really regulate it in that way. I think I'm trying to I'm trying to think on the fly. Uh, I don't know what rights we have to regulate that through ordinance. Um, and that's I'm not an attorney, so I can't for sure say that. Um, but what I'll say is um, your lesson for the day, your law lesson for the day, uh, states come in, in two types. You've got a home rule state and you have a Dillon's rule state. So home rule states, uh, towns can do whatever they want as long as the state doesn't say you can't. In a Dillon's rule state, you can only, as a town, you can only do what the state says you're allowed to do. Those are the only rights you have. Um, we are a Dillon's rule state, so we can only do what authorities have been granted to communities. I don't know of any statutes. That's not to say there aren't any there. I think that would be a question that uh, the League of Cities and Towns or our city attorney would have to go and kind of dig into to see if there's any any areas where we can regulate ownership type or, you know, like some states out west are, you know, prohibiting foreign governments or foreign foreign agents from purchasing land in certain areas because they're worried about China purchasing farms near Air Force bases for spying, those types of things. Uh, I, I don't know if we've got those rights. That would be a question for an attorney. Um, I, I can just add to that more direct to the question, just as far as the Planning Commission's attitude. And um, I think I can safely say that our general attitude is that we think that there's a major problem with with a lack of rentals and there's a major problem with a lack of home ownership and we would like to address both. And at this point, uh, you know, we wanna do things like this to try to encourage both of those things to get better, hopefully. Uh, and I just don't even know if we're like, you know, we don't have the luxury of having a preference at this point. I'm not sure that we would ever want a preference, but, but uh, I, it's just not something I think that we're concerned with trying to to influence. Uh, Nathan. Just a, um, was that Sal's comment made me think of something, and this is a little bit outside the nine dots, but if the, and, and we don't necessarily have a city that's terribly entrepreneurial, but it could be that uh, either the city or a sort of extra governmental body like a Montpelier Live, but for housing, could bid on properties that are for sale with the intent to, you know, if it's a three unit, with the intent to purchase it, make it into condos, and then sell it to the market um, as the sort of enabler of that action. And, it, um, you know, so when I, if I buy a three unit, I'm buying a used, used housing that's pre-existing. I'm not adding to the housing count. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm ensuring my future wealth right? Because long-term it's going to work out. Whereas if those become condos, they are entry points to the to equity and to the housing market for first-time home buyers, which would be awesome. So from a mission perspective, if the city or some arm of the city were to say, eh, let's, let's try to get 
you know, let's try to help more people enter enter home ownership by doing by buying that. You know, the one on Franklin just came on the market. It's a, I don't know, it was a five or five or six unit, five unit, I think. You know, if the city bought that, made it into condos, and then all of a sudden sells sells five condos, and that that would be transformative. And if it if it matched the the goals, uh, that could be pretty cool. Just my opinion. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Unfortunately, I mean, the, those really big idea things are just, we're, we're just a little planning commission. <laughs> It'd be nice if we were the kings of Montpelier and could. <laughs> but I think that have, like, I'm so, I'm, I'm happy to have that as part of, I mean, I'm not trying to be dismissive because, like, I think that things like, the ideas like that should be continue to be part of our conversation because I think that that we we can do some big things. Um, and shouldn't be scared to. So, um, I, anybody Kirby, else? Uh, yeah. Devorah Jonas has been trying to get your attention. Oh, okay. I um, I didn't see a hand. Maybe he was waving. It was waving. He was waving. Yeah. I don't know how to do the hand thing. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. So, uh, yeah. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to. I've been listening to this, and I was wondering. If even if we have the four units as a density thing, if there could be some leeway so that the gentleman who was speaking about wanting to do the seven units, that one could say, okay, we have this as the general rule, but we can ask for a variance. And couldn't we have a, an arrangement like that so that each time someone wanted to do something special, there would be a possibility for it? That's it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, Peter was talking about flexibility, which is, I think, the same thing you're saying. Yeah. Um, okay. So, does anyone else have anything else on uh, density? And if not, um, I did say that I would open up about other just um, uh, zoning ideas in case people were coming with those. Uh, Barb. Yeah, just a quick comment um, to the last speaker. Um, we do have uh, a density bonuses available um, depending on dedicating different types of uh, apartments or whatever to um, elderly housing or ADA compliance. So it's possible that they could actually put more units in there than are te te technically required by by the zoning. Those are still in place, correct, Mike? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was able to add one, so I could do five instead of four, but not seven. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification, Peter. Um, okay. So anything else on density? Uh, if not, if, if anybody has uh, any other zoning ideas, um, anything they'd like to to uh, let the planning commission know about. Um, I want to give that space now if if people would like to. Okay, so we're a focus group, I guess. Good. Um, okay, so with that, I want to move on on the agenda uh, unless uh, we have anything else from any community members? Um, any planning commissioners want to talk to city before we move on? Just, yeah, just had a good list, a good listen, listening session. Um, okay, well, we're gonna move on on the agenda then. Uh, and honestly, we're, well, we got a little bit of time. So uh, I think we are going to move on to part six of the agenda, which is to review the arts and culture word storyboard um, for the city plan. Um, Mike, do you have anything specific in mind on that? Um, no, I, that is another one that is in our drive there which i don't know if you want to pull it up or if you want me to pull it up i can pull it up Uh, 
Okay. Uh, so I had thought that I had looked at this before, and it, we've you know we've had a choppy summer as far as our meetings go. Um, so folks could take a take a look at it. Um, it's not something I've recently reviewed. Has anybody has anybody on a, have any planning commissioners had a chance to? Take Were a look you able at this? to pull it up or no? Yeah, I do have it pulled up right here. Okay, um, you didn't share it. That's because I'm wondering whether I whether we want to just hold off on this or not. Uh, so here's the draft storyboard. Um, we, this is a second draft. Um, my memory is coming to me, right, Mike? We've reviewed this before and we had. I remember having, I, I don't know anything about this, but I remember Maria had a lot of like really good comments. So I remember that we talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm remembering that, yeah. And so maybe and it is already different. approved. They were asking us which ones had been approved and I didn't see a quick approval on this one, so. It, it this looks like it's been, yeah, changed post feedback from us because it, it didn't open up this way. I, I um, so I do think I like it. So if everybody could take a minute just to, to read over it, um, see if we if we notice anything else. Anyone have any feedback so far? The the magazine reference thing is something that the consultants did. It's interesting. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on using that reference. Um, Kirby, do you know if that's a recent? Uh, best of list. Yeah, the first time we looked at this, I pulled it up, and it was pretty recent. Okay. But those things are always changing, and that's an that's something that crossed my mind is that that magazine may very well put out a new nine best the next month. You should um, probably make a note to that they should put a date on that. You know. In 2022 or in 2023. Anything else? I think uh, I think it be, it's good to pass along, Mike. Um, right, cause they're they're building these things out. Uh, I'm going to try to get them in for one of our meetings coming up. Our grant technically runs out at the end of either end of September or end of October, so um, they're going to be putting together a whole bunch of these. And again, um, once they're in storyboard, we can always go back. We, we always still have opportunities to make changes right on through. So, and I think that 
this just leaves us with community services and land use is the only two that aren't aren't done so that's good uh, yeah and as soon as you have any kind of bandwidth mike i think that it probably is good for us to get started on land use um that's going to be that's going to be a, a you know uh as a reminder of the planning commission land use is the chapter that we write entirely ourselves we're not having um a draft of something sent to us so we need to take all of the our previous work from the city plan and and sum that up into a holistic land use plan i guess we're, we're going to probably have something to work off of right Mike? we'll probably work yeah, off I'll of put, I'll, i will put i will put a draft i'll put a draft together that um, you guys can work with uh so yeah so so uh i'll work with mike and, and gabe and i'll work with mike to uh get get that going on the agenda soon but for everybody else think about a vision for that uh and we can try to we can try to incorporate that vision i mean some questions are going to be you know how much are flood issues going to be on our minds how much we talk about housing a lot is that something that you know want to make forefront Etc. Um, okay, so uh, I think we're good. We don't uh, without a vote there, uh, which just leaves us with just with the so, minutes and and if anyone has any questions on what's been going on, obviously we haven't met since. Oh, well, we met once briefly since the flood, but if anyone's got questions of that stuff, um, if you haven't heard or didn't know, we are meeting. Uh, we met with FEMA up at the site, um, up at Country Club Road. So we're actually uh, proposing, they're proposing, we'll see if it goes through, putting Washington County's emergency housing, so they're the FEMA trailers, putting 36 FEMA trailers up Country Club Road. So um, that will hopefully help us build the road system. We made all those plans to build out the lower part of the Country Club for high density housing. This would give us an opportunity to have FEMA pay for putting in the, the sewer and water lines into that area. And then we would have the ability to um, use them later as the FEMA trailers are removed. So that's the um, one of the things that's going on that you'll probably hear some more about. And we've been obviously spending most of our time in the department just addressing the flooding. Um, most specifically, my office has been trying to work with, well, from the permit side, we're handling obviously all the all those permits, but from the um, the personal side, we've been um, working with the folks that have had flooding into the first floor. So the most significantly damaged folks, we're trying to get money to try to elevate housing and to try to make sure they've got emergency housing. So that's been our, a lot of our focus, uh, trying to learn all this, the FEMA rules to try to get ourselves in a position to be able to apply for grants, to tear down, um, do some buyouts if that's appropriate, but also to try to elevate buildings and that's a lot of what we've been working on. Mike, would this would the city be doing this buyouts or would it be just kind of facilitating FEMA doing it or how's that work? If they're buyouts, we'd be we have to be the applicants, I think. We'd we'd be a part of it. I know we would be a part of it. I don't know all the specifics. Okay. And what would be the um what would the city do with the land after? It's required, if it gets it to be a buyout, then it's required to be conserved so that it would become owned by the city, but with a perpetual easement that prevents it to be developed in the future, which is why we're trying to limit where that happens. In some cases, it's appropriate, and it is the most appropriate thing to do. Um, that happened in Northfield. That's happened in um, some places in Barrie. There's a number of properties that just they should never have been there in the first place, and it's time to buy them out, make sure there's nothing there. We don't have a lot of those. 
Um, most of ours are places that flooded that would be a fine place to have a house, uh, except that it was never elevated. So what we really need to do is either maybe knock the house down, you know, find a developer that'll knock the house down and build a new house, but elevated or to help them get some money to let them stay in their house, but elevate their house and keep it. So those are some of the options we're trying to work with people. Maybe they want to sell their house to somebody who wants to elevate it. Maybe they want to elevate it themselves. Maybe they just want to put it on the market and walk away. Um, so those are a lot of the different options people have. And then in some cases, people are uh, looking at a buyout, but we don't have too many of those right now. Mike, I was just wondering about the, you said that FEMA is putting in trailers. Yes. 30 trailers. Well, where did the 30 number come from? And is that uh, like to satisfy, you know, everyone who may have lost housing due to the flood? So I, I think the number they're, they're asking for is 36 and it's supposed to be based on their models and estimates of the need. And surprisingly, um, what they said is if you've got basically one in 10 people who are eligible for emergency housing will actually take it. So I'm not exactly sure if it's just because people have other resources, they have other options, they have, if it's just pride, I don't know, but they said usually one in 10 is about the going average for people who are willing to accept emergency housing. So we're trying, if you know anyone who needs emergency housing, whether you are a homeowner, whether you are a renter, um, it has to be people who, I believe, it has to be people who were housed. So an unhoused person can't go in and get a, a, one of these um, emergency trailers. But whoever it is, if you have any thought, you can always go and just register at the FEMA center and go and say you'd like to register for emergency housing and be put on the list. Um, people can always say later they don't want it, but we try to get as many people in to go through and say, go in and talk to them and say you want it. If you know somebody who needs it, whether they're a renter or a homeowner, go in and register because that's how you get on the list and that's how you get in there. And that's how they decide how many trailers to buy and put in there. So, okay. How long are they available to be used as housing? Uh, there's 18... 18 to 24 months from the date of the flood. So it's actually going to take them till December to get them put in and open for business. So that would be, they're trying to get them in for December. So you've already lost six months of the 18 months that you can use them for. Um, so that's, but we expect, my expectation is that it would be probably the reality it take is it takes a little bit longer to get all the way, everybody in, everybody out. Knowing the building seasons um, up here, I would expect if they were opened in December, that they would be open. They wouldn't be open for only 18 months. It wouldn't make any sense. It would have to be probably 24 months because that would be two building seasons. So if somebody's house was destroyed, they've got basically most of two building seasons to get a new house built or to find new housing. Um, so, but we'll, we'll learn more as the process comes in. We're just in the early stages right now, but I wanted to let you guys know that that is something we've been working on here in the office. Oh, I think Nathan has, do you have a comment or a question? <laughs> this is off topic and very quick. Uh, I missed whatever presentation about the four sort of thoughts or proposals about zoning. Um, and I just, uh, Mike or Kirby, if I can find a way to look at those sometime, I would like to look at them. That's all. Thank you. What's your email? Nathan Suter, N-A-T-H-A-N-S-U-T-E-R at Gmail. All right. Pretty easy. We did a, we did a write-up for the bridge. It's possible that it's on the bridge's website. I haven't actually checked. Um, but yeah, he can send you. Are you going to send him your presentation, Mike, or? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Mike, my other question, um, this 
the raising of the houses and the flood zone sounds just like a major endeavor to me. Um, like I'm imagining like a house going up on stilts. Is that the idea? Like, is that really? Uh, no, it's, it's it, it, it gets jacked up. Um, so they run boards, uh, beams underneath it and they lift the house up. So as we were talking about elevating it, it doesn't stay on piers. This isn't like uh, the, the Grand Banks off of North Carolina or something. This is, you, you'll lift the building up, you'll pour a whole new foundation, you'll pour a slab, and then you put the building back down on top of it. Um, so either there'll be a crawl space underneath it and you keep your wooden floor, or you remove your wooden floor altogether and you set the building down and then you have a concrete slab, which you then put, you know, you can tile, you can put other things on top of it directly. But then the idea is the level of that new concrete slab is at least two feet under our under our flood codes. And we're recommending anyone who elevates their house to be three feet above just to be, if we're going to spend all the time and money, it costs about 200000 to elevate the house. All the electrical has to get elevated, all the sewer lines, all the water lines, everything has to get hooked up. And then you put it down. It's about 200000 to do that whole process. And if we're going to do all that, doesn't cost any more to go up three feet than it does two feet so you might as well mm -hmm. how how much of uh, that that expense um will fema and the city and you know other sources take care of i guess or maybe it varies by the person but you know yeah it it varies and it's challenging and for fema it's very, very daunting to use FEMA to elevate a building. Um, very few were ele elevated after Irene. One of the big um, obstacles is that when you do a cost benefit analysis, which you have to do for all of these FEMA things, they, they immediately, as soon as you go in and say it's a historic building, which most of our buildings are, or eligible for historic registry, which almost all of our buildings are, then it becomes very expensive to, uh, and fails to BCA because you've got to go through and do everything to historic codes because you're using federal money. And so after Irene, there were 10 properties, as an example, 10 properties in Waterbury who wanted to be elevated. At the end of the day, only one got elevated. The one that got elevated was the not historic one. The other nine buildings that were historic either remained where they were and got reflooded in July or were demolished. So it's kind of an ironic twist that because you can't put a historic foundation under a historic building, we would rather destroy the building than to have a not historic foundation under it. Makes no sense to me. I think it's boneheaded, but that's the, that's, that's FEMA's philosophy. So because we have 18 housing units, in those 10 buildings that we want to elevate here in Montpelier, we're making a special pitch and we're pushing very hard on our legislators to go to take state money to give the city $2 million of state money so that way we don't have all those FEMA strings and save these buildings. So that's our push and that's what we've been pressing for really, really hard because um, it costs 400000 to build a new unit on average. And that's, you know, the state numbers when they say, hey, we, we're getting $880 million for new affordable housing, which they allocated last year, $80 million. We asked for $2 million to save 18 units. They said, no, we're only using this to build new units. So if we demolish those 18 units, it would cost $8 million to replace them. But they won't give me $2 million to save them. Again, uh, I, I've said this many, many times. Logic only gets you so far. I would think spending $2 million to save 18 units is a far better use of our money than to spend $2 million to demolish the building and then $8 million to replace those units. Um, so I'm trying very hard, and the legislate, legislators are getting it. They do understand it, but it's always a battle because they have to go and convince all the other legislators to allocate. And it's not... They, they're start, starting to expand it. So they're going to try to make it a $5 million program to include other towns. It's not just money for Montpelier, but it would be money for other towns that were 
similarly damaged that would say, hey, if, if your building can be saved reasonably with elevating the foundation, um, we'll provide that money. Um, because all of these folks did everything correctly. All, all the folks we're working with all have flood insurance. They all did things, everything they were supposed to. They, they took out flood insurance. They did everything. But the money will only let them fix their building exactly where it is. It won't let them elevate it. And they're just like, well, why would I spend my $250,000 to fix my house and leave it to flood again? So that's that's why we're doing it the way we are. And I, I'm hoping we'll get it. So that's the long answer to the question of what will FEMA do? Nothing, which is why we're going to ask the state to step up and do their stuff, uh, do to fill in the fill in the gap. Okay, thanks, Mike. And uh, um, it was a good update because it, it filled up the rest of our time perfectly. So, um, okay, guys, we'll we'll meet again in a couple of weeks. Um, we'll be probably working on the city plan again. Um, and uh, does anybody have anything before we go? No? Okay. Uh, well, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion from John. Do we have a second? No, second. Second from Maria. Those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 All right, everybody. See you in two weeks. Have a great Thanks, night. Thanks, everyone. See you guys. We'll definitely be recapping this, by the way. We'll be, you know, we'll be debriefing everything from tonight, the, the next meeting. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Kirby.